This series that we're having on the second Sunday night of the month, or the third Sunday night, if I'm on vacation in Minnesota on the second Sunday night, Modern Challenges to the Ancient Faith, which means this series is looking at people who live during our period of time, who are frequently in the news, who make criticisms or challenges against Christianity. Generally speaking, when they are criticizing Christianity, they're criticizing their perception of Christianity. Often it's the Catholic Church, since it uh, is frequently the, the religion that's in the news most frequently. And that in and of itself shows that a lot of times the criticisms are not of biblical Christianity. But some criticisms are of biblical Christianity or, or what the Bible teaches and it helps us to know, as we tried to talk about this morning, dads, giving our, our children ammunition or at least defense against some of these criticisms. And so the study that we're going to look at, look at tonight is the challenge, how can you take the Bible literally? If your brother told you that he literally died of embarrassment when the girl he liked read his Valentine's Day card, you would not marvel at his resurrection. You would understand him to be speaking figuratively. But if he told you he was contemplating suicide because he was heartbroken at her rejection of him, then you would do well to take him literally. Well, how do we know the difference? Common sense the context, the relationship that you have with that particular individual. But both literal and figurative language are used regularly. You and I use it on a, on a daily basis. So some people say, is it not consistent to read some text literally in the Bible and others not? So that's a criticism. Our lives are littered with metaphors. We bust our gut working. We love with our whole heart. Recent research in communication has verified what poets have known for years, and that is humans love figurative language. We love metaphors. We find them memorable and persuasive and moving. In 2014, preachers across the United States were ask their view of the Bible, and this is across the board, religiously speaking. What do you agree with? The statement, the Bible is the actual Word of God and is to be taken literally, word for word. 28% agreed with that statement. The Bible is the inspired Word of God, but not everything should be taken literally. That's 47%. Or the Bible is an ancient book of fable, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. These are preachers. 21% agree with that statement. To take the Bible literally word for word misses the point. When Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he obviously is not claiming to be a farmer. And it doesn't take reading the text, text very deeply to realize that. He is using a metaphor used for God as a shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd, David says in Psalms 23, verse 1, and he's applying that to himself. The same thing is true when Jesus says, I am divine, in John 15, and verse 1. You don't have to have very high education to realize that he's using a metaphor. And we make metaphors by noticing connections. Love is a sickness. Life is a marathon. Parents are helicopters. But God did not notice fatherly love and then decide to call himself a father. But rather God created fatherhood so that the best in dads would give us a glimpse of the nature of God. God is not patterned after fatherhood. Fatherhood is patterned after God. The same thing is true with the intimacy of the sexual relationship and marriage. 
God did not see those things and then decide that he would call Jesus the bridegroom and the church the bride. But rather, God created the sexual relationship and the, the, the marriage relationship to reflect something that was already existing. And that's God's love, his passionate, sacrificial love for his people. As with many conversations, some parts of it have to be taken literally and some parts have to be taken figuratively. But there are times when people who take the Bible seriously disagree on whether or not a statement should be taken literally or whether or not it is a metaphor. To give you a popular example, the story of the rich man and Lazarus, is that reality or is it a parable? Ultimately, it does not matter. The nature of a parable is that it can be true. When you look at the parables of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, nothing in those parables are outside the realm of reality. That's the nature of a parable. It is taking something that is normal, that is natural, and then drawing a spiritual conclusion from it, which is in contrast to a fable. In a fable, you have talking animals and talking trees. There are some fables that are recorded in the Bible. But those things don't happen in reality, even though they're used to teach a lesson. The whole Bible is not fable. The whole Bible is not a myth. On the surface and even after in-depth study, the Bible presents itself as being a history book. It is fundamentally a history book with some fables thrown in, parables thrown in, other genre of literature that are thrown in. And that history, as I've tried to emphasize in different lessons, that history can be verified. If, if it exists in secular history, it can be verified according to the Bible. There are times when people who take the Bible seriously, again, disagree on whether or not a statement is literal or metaphorical, history or parable. And that's for us as students to study and to determine whether or not the context requires us to take it one way or the other. Another criticism that people offer against the Bible is that it's full of contradictions. Skeptics and others who drink too deeply from the Kool-Aid of skepticism accuse the Bible of being full of contradictions. For example, they challenge Moses, or whoever the author of Genesis is. Most, of, most Old Testament scholars across the world today do not believe Moses wrote Genesis. But whoever the author of Genesis was, they believe that Genesis chapter 1 is a different account of the creation than Genesis chapter 2. Chapter 2, they believe, has some contradictions from chapter 1. There are similar accusations leveled against some of the teachings and sayings of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'll come back to that point in just a moment. But various accounts of the same event are normally theological and not chronological. For example, Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Genesis chapter 1 is a discussion of the universal creation of the world. In chapter 2, Moses, whom I believe wrote Genesis, focuses on the creation of Adam and Eve. That's a theological purpose. So nothing in chapter 2 contradicts chapter 1. It's just an elaboration on what happened on day 6. It gives us a bifocal vision, if you will, of the accounts when we get more than one perspective. And let me give you this example that I have on the screen. In some texts, Jesus is considered our high priest. He's also considered, of course, the sacrificial lamb. In a couple of texts... Romans chapter 3, 1 John chapter 2, Jesus is pictured as the mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant where the sacrifice was actually made. Well, skeptics will say that the authors of the Bible are just coming up with these kind of things, and that's why they're contradictions. Is that a contradiction? Does it have to be a contradiction, or could it be the case that Jesus is, in fact, our high priest, and he is the sacrificial lamb, and he is the mercy seat, depending on which perspective you look at him? And I think you all understand that and you agree with me, we're looking at different pictures of Jesus in his role in redemption. Bart Ehrman is a scholar who is uh, 
interviewed quite often in news reports. He teaches religion at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he's written extensively about differences and concluded that the Bible is irreconcilably contradictory. But some of the examples betray a bias or simply ignorance of the facts. And it causes people like him and others to draw unnecessary conclusions. For example, the two quotations on the screen. Ehrman notes in Matthew's gospel that Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me, Matthew 12 and verse 30. But in Mark's account, Jesus says, the one who is not against us is for us, Mark 9 and verse 40. So there's a contradiction, Ehrman and others say. In fact, there's a quotation from his book, did Jesus say both things? Could he mean both things? How can both be true at once? Or is it possible that one of the gospel writers got things switched around? Notice the, the presupposition that the writer is not guided by the Holy Spirit. The concept of inspiration by the Holy Spirit is completely foreign to these men. So did Matthew change Mark or did Mark change Matthew? That's what these kind of scholars debate. But now to use a secular example of the same idea... I offer a famous quotation from a book by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Well, two different men must have wrote that sentence because they're contradicting each other. Well, no. All of us with a modicum of common sense knows that he's using the word times in different ways, with different definitions, different perspectives, and we all recognize that. Now, some puzzles arise from the assumption that Jesus did things only once. For example, Matthew and Mark present Jesus clearing out the money changers from the temple at the end of his ministry, Matthew chapter 21 and Mark chapter 11. John presents Jesus clearing out the money changers from the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 2. So these so-called scholars will say, well, either Matthew and Mark changed John or John changed Matthew and Mark. Could it be that Jesus cleaned out the temple twice? Once at the beginning of his ministry and then three years later he did it again. There's no reason why that could not have happened. And in fact, the, the fact that Jesus cleaned out the money changers the second time three years later might help explain some of the animosity that the Pharisees felt towards Jesus and why they asked him the question, by whose authority do you do these things? There's no reason to believe that Jesus did not do that twice. Another example, the common perception is that the Sermon on the Mount, recorded in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, is the same sermon as a sermon recorded in Luke chapter 6 that is often called the Sermon on the Plain because Luke presents it as being a Sermon on the Plain. And then they say, well, this was moved here, this paragraph was moved here, and Matthew left this out, and Luke left that out, and Mark added this. But think about the ministry of Jesus. So far as we know, he preached for three, maybe three and a half years. Do you think he ever said the same thing twice? Even in the same sermon, could Jesus have said the same thing two different ways? I bet if you went back and listened to my sermon this morning, you would notice that I said the exact same thing in two different ways. And it very well could be the fact that Matthew, guided by the Holy Spirit, recorded one way that Jesus said it, and Mark or Luke recorded the same sentence, worded differently, also guided by the Holy Spirit. There's no reason why that couldn't be done. Because again, I think we as preachers and teachers do the same thing all the time. Another criticism. What about the other Gospels? And I meant to bring my copies of the Gnostic Gospels that I have in my library. If you've read or if you've seen the movie uh, based on Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, he popularized the idea that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that we have in our Bibles were selected at the expense of other accounts of the life of Jesus. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John supposedly were found to be more popular among the early Christians. Um, but the other accounts that probably are more accurate, they say, uh, which are oftentimes more feminized, those were left out by the men who were in charge of the whole thing. But Bart Ehrman, as critical as he is of other things in the New Testament, acknowledges that the four Gospels that we have in the New Testament, he is, he is an expert on early Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. That's his area of scholarly research. He says that our Gospels, the ones we have, are the oldest and best sources we have for knowing about the life of Jesus. He observes that this is the view of all serious historians of antiquity of, of every kind, from committed evangelical Christians to hardcore atheists. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have more evidence for being the earliest, best testimony to the life of Jesus than all of these other Gospels that Dan Brown suggests and others in his novel. The politically correct suggestion nowadays to make is that those excluded Gospels represent a more feminist version of Christianity uh, that was squeezed out by the early church under the guidance of the men. But the historical evidence just does not support it. Other writings about Jesus were circulating in the early centuries of the church. In fact, the Apostle Paul refers to other letters that were being written by other people under his name in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So even during the life of Paul, people were writing letters under his name trying to present false ideas. And that's why at the end of the letter, Paul says, I sign my letters with my own hand. There's a good evidence that the four New Testament Gospels are closer to the life and death and resurrection of Jesus in terms of the date of their composition and the connection to the apostles who were eyewitnesses of those events. Now from the existing manuscripts, more than 5,000 that we have of the New Testament, the Gospels we have were far more widely read from the eastern uh, inhabited world at the time to the western inhabited world were far more widespread than any of the other writings before the Bible itself was put together in the form that we have it today, which was about the second century A.D., which about a hundred years after John the Apostle died. So in other words, for about a hundred years, for, from the evidence that we have, for about a hundred years, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were being circulated individually. But about a hundred years after John died, they started to be bound together. Luke and Acts were bound together because they were obviously written by the same man. Matthew and Mark uh, were bound together. So how confident can we be that the Gospels that are included in our Bibles today are written by eyewitnesses? Well, all it takes is just examining the evidence. So let's talk about the eyewitnesses. Bart Ehrman stands in a long line of... Uh, academics who have argued that the Gospels are internally inconsistent and poorly aligned with known history because they are products of an extended oral tradition and were manipulated for theological reasons by later generations. There's no evidence for that. There's just no evidence for it. But that is the prevailing view of the Bible in schools of religion across the world. In the book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, a British scholar by the name of Richard Balkman uses his knowledge, just, just to give one small example. He uses his knowledge of contemporary customs, first century uh, Roman world, of citing eyewitnesses to illuminate the names that, are, that, are, that pop up all the time in the New Testament. What are some of the, just, you don't have to answer out loud, but what are the, some of the common names that, are, that pop up in the New Testament? John, there's several Johns, there's several James, there's several Simons. These eyewitnesses told their stories as authoritative guarantors of that tradition. For example, those were popular names among Jews in the first century, indicating the nature of eyewitnesses that were watching and seeing and recording what they saw. With our modern sensibilities, it is easy to miss 
to give you another example. The significance of women being the first witnesses to the resurrection. I've got a book in my library that I find useful from some perspectives, a feminist perspective of the Old Testament. Some of these scholars like Bart Ehrman want to argue that the early Christians were governed by men and so they shutted women to the side. They do the same thing with the Old Testament. When you read the book of Genesis, and I did an in-depth study of the book of Genesis last year, you see where women were not shut aside. Uh, Rebecca, for example, prayed to God on her own. There's no, no indication that Rebecca went to Isaac or a priest in order to talk to God. The text shows that Rebecca talked to God on her own. A misogynist would not write that. The Bible was not written by misogynists. It was guided by the Holy Spirit even if it was penned by men. The significance of women being the first witnesses to the resurrection. In contemporary Jewish culture, the testimony of women in the court of law was not credible. Women were not allowed to give testimony in court because they were considered to be too emotional, uh, too, too guided by emotions, and not able to be credible witnesses. But if you look at God's Word in Luke chapter 24 and verse 10, for example, the eyewitnesses of the resurrection of the Son of God were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women with them who saw the resurrection of Christ and then testified to the apostles. That's not some woman-hating Jew that wrote that. He would not write that, not in the first century and not in the Jewish culture. You may have heard me or some other preacher or teacher make the comment that there were rabbis who had a prayer where they thanked God that they were not a Gentile or a woman. And that's contemporary Jewish culture. That's not New Testament teaching. If there is a God who created the universe... We cannot exclude the possibility of miracles, of the Holy Spirit guiding the authors of the New Testament, which these people do. They just exclude the possibility of miracles, and they don't accept the guidance of the Holy Spirit on these writers. The one who made the laws of nature in the first place can surely intervene when he chooses. He can surely make sure that his word the only map we have on how to get to heaven is provided for us without error, verifiable, so that we can follow it, so that we can understand it, and we can follow it, and we can get to heaven. He's the one who brought life in the first place, and he's promised to raise the dead. He wants us to trust him, and he's given us a book so that we can have a reason to trust Him. Next month, we'll take a look at does science disprove Christianity? If you need our prayers, your church family, for your walk with Christ this evening, if you need our encouragement for any challenge that you face in your life, let us know what we can do. Let's stand and sing together.